an actual partial figure coming down the steps on the side. But again, just a lot of drawing with charcoal, kind of maps, fractured maps and landscapes. How long does it take you to work on a drawing that elaborate, would you say? Do you do it in several sessions? or uh, Sometimes start to finish, and other times, mm -hmm. you know, get a little corner, mm -hmm. and then it goes away, and I have to turn to something work all else. the impulses there. Can't work unless it's, uh, I know what to do. So uh, sometimes it just all comes out, and other times a few marks and uh, get lost and uh, have to try something else, do something else. That's probably how writing and watercolors get in is on a different scale. I'm going to go a little more quickly now, just to kind of make sure we get through it all. Okay. So uh, let's let's try to do that pace-wise, because right. we're only in the 80s here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so tell us about this one. I uh, got invited to uh, work with uh, the Lippincott uh, Foundry up in uh, North Haven, Connecticut. And so did a number of pieces <clears throat> with them. And uh, this was just a, a piece. Uh, we did a, a performance piece with some students uh, at the University of Colorado, actually, as I was returning to the West Coast after that year in New York. And we did a, a play there called Parachutes, Dumbbells, and Me. And dumbbells kind of got into the uh, imagery at that point, and so this is. Is that Mr. Unnatural's hat there on the yeah, on the left? Yeah, yeah. it's a, the dunce and the gentleman, okay. and there's a conversation. It's uh, the the two hats are made out of lead, and uh, there's a conversation sprinkled back and forth on the on the hats and on the piece itself, and then a lead skeleton that's. Uh, uh, hanging on there to the, uh, the dumbbell part. Nomad is an Island, uh, that was actually the first piece I tried at uh, Lippincott, and it's based basically on that rusting barrel I found out behind the shop. Right before I came back, um, there was an article in uh, Chronicle about all the nuclear waste <coughs> that had been dumped out, <coughs> excuse me, around the Farallon Islands and all these rusting barrels that were starting to fall apart and the weird things that were happening about them. And so uh, when I got back, that was kind of <clears throat> foremost in my mind. And, and uh, again, Westerman kind of enters in there, Nomad. He used mm -hmm. that title a lot. And I once thought, Nomad, not me, Mad, is an island of a, of a sort. And so the, the title is what supports the, the piece. The, the heart shape. Yeah. Okay, and now we've got a really elaborate painting with assemblage. Yeah, not to worry, it's juxtaposition. <laughs> uh, interior of my studio, partially. In fact, there's a picture of me sitting in a chair in there. Uh, coming down off that kind of fat lightning bolt are people arriving in the new world. Hmm. Uh, I remember a lady saying, babushka, my babushka. Don't shove me, put a lot of room in the new world. And, uh, the Smithsonian, bless their heart, took this piece on. Hmm. Another piece from Lippincott, Boo Da Da Barbecue. Um, and there's text in the piece which we have inscribed there. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine uh, gave, uh, gave me a, a little barbecue she got <clears throat> in uh, Mexico. The upper part, the slanted part, were license plates, and the lower part was an olive oil can. And then in Philadelphia one time, I found a, a cast boot out of plaster that also had a slot in his chest. It was a Buddha bank. And uh, so I never had known where to set this little Buddha bank until I got the, uh, the little barbecue from Mexico. And uh, one time at Lippincott, while a larger piece was being constructed, all these uh, various uh, materials were laying around. And I started thinking about that Buddhist phrase is that a wooden Buddha can't get you through the fire an iron boot that can't get you across the water. So I stacked up the materials. And then thinking about the little one I had at home, we constructed this, um, this upper part. And uh, 
instead of the license plates, I just poured many colors down down the side, and uh, then wrote stories uh, about uh, that I picked up either through reading or uh, hearing from uh, people uh, about Buddha or uh, spiritual thinking and. Uh, like uh, one of the monks asked Buddha one time, he said, uh, uh, let's see how to go, uh, uh, how do things change and, and not change? And the Buddha supposedly said, the fire that burns all through the night in the, in the morning is not the same fire, nor is it a different one. So that's inscribed on there along with some other stories. So with this yeah, series, yeah. you uh, paid homage to some of your musical favorites. Yeah, here again, got invited to uh, work in uh, San Francisco at, uh, can you remember the name of the place? Garner Tullis set it up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He wasn't there at the time. And um, so I've uh, been wanting to do something with guitar shape, and uh, so uh, started with, uh, I had him cut me out several blanks, and then I did uh, woodcuts. Of, uh, of the guitars, and then once I was through with the woodcuts, uh, some of them I strung up into instruments. Uh, did one on Agent Orange, um, uh, Mar uh, uh, Muddy Waters, Muddy and Marvin Gaye, and, Marvin Gaye. and uh, that one doesn't play, but uh, Agent Orange had uh, three strings and uh, can play it mm -hmm. to some degree. And then also uh, decided to, uh, uh, I made an initial construction, found a wine box, a wooden wine box, and I made uh, kind of a prototype for the uh, banjo. On the, and it's partial painting, and, and we just used my original to make, uh, again, the, at the workshop, creative workshop in San Francisco, to make some blanks, and uh, then I paint and decorate, string them up, and uh, also yeah, they could play. Drifting in, you know, came from a story about hearing uh, about how many uh, miles of net are released every morning in, uh, in the North Sea. It's thousands, of, you know, miles and miles of these drifting nets to catch fish. But I found out through this article that it catches a lot more than what you're after. And sometimes it gets so heavy with all the, the drowned and dead creatures that the nets sink and they never get the, and sometimes it's so heavy with uh, the, uh, the the dead creatures they can't winch it back on board, and so it's just a, a piece about that. And Mr. Uh, Bones, Mr. Bones, yeah, yeah. the old farrier. Uh, it was uh, taking down some one by twelve uh, shelving material in the studio and just deciding to. Uh, chip away and uh, just chipped out the skeleton and uh, I rode as a kid that had horses growing up in Indiana and Texas and, uh, and so uh, just some of the things, the farrier, you know, horseshoe guy and the old farrier Boone, uh, Bones Lacrosse and uh, there's a horse in the background he's saying might put a little heavier shoe on him and fix that gate. And here's a tower that, uh, when I was looking at it, I was remember, re re reminded of our own hemisphere mm. tower here. Tell us about this project. Well, uh, Lippincott's noted for large-scale uh, work. In fact, uh, Jonathan Lippincott, Don's son, has recently published a book called uh, Large Scale, where he chronicles a lot of the, all the big olden birds mm. were made at uh, Lippincott, and they did a lot of the... Uh, large-scale fabrication that was going on in the 60s and 70s and I guess into the 80s. And I, I would go back and stay for a couple of weeks and like do Nomad and they, or they'd get it started and I'd come back and they'd be further along. So at one point Don said, do you have any ideas for, most of the pieces had been compared to what they did, fairly modest scale, and he said, do you have any ideas for a large piece? And I said, yeah, I'd like to do a tower. <clears throat> and so in a local salvage uh, area there in North Haven, we found some big steel tanks, and when we cut them open, inside were these bronze tanks, which had, it had some insulation and, and some more volatile material inside. So these are two bronze tanks uh, stacked on top of each other. And I said, I'd like to have a piece that you could go into 
and go up. So there's a spiral stairway that takes you to the top. There's images cut into the, the side of the tower so when the sun's out, they project on the opposite wall and kind of change shape and crawl around as the, as the sun moves. Uh, also, when I first got there, there was a, a big pyramid setting out back, and I said, what's that? And he said, that's uh, Barty Newman's broken obelisk. Mm. And he said the initial one, the juncture where the obelisk and the point of the pyramid meet, he said that was too weak, and so we had to fabricate another one. He said, if you ever have any ideas for it, feel free to use it. So in, it's not in this picture, but it's part of the installation of the piece. <laughs> I, I recapped it in a stainless steel. It's setting a little bit off to the side. And there's some other salvage material that aren't added in here that uh, was around the... Uh... But running out of the forest, now we're in the 90s. Let's just kind of flip through a few of these now. Because sure. We're... Getting all in. And then you moved to this um, series where you appropriated some art history images. Just yeah. briefly, uh, maybe tell us what the, what, why you appropriated the imagery. Uh, the first impetus was uh, after Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. I was uh, uh, a friend of mine went to Chernobyl after some, oh, maybe 10 years after it had happened. Uh, Polbrook Peter is his name, and he was a social worker and a really a poet. Uh, anyway, publisher poetry books, he sent me a, 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 his diary basically from Chernobyl mm -hmm. and it was just devastating stories of uh, animals so radioactive on a farm that nobody wanted to have anything to do with them, a woman coming into a place where they were testing honey and she, uh, the, the thing was so radioactive that it couldn't register and she told the doctor that she'd been feeding the honey to her child who was sick with the cold. He said, destroy the hive, still needing more of it. And I wanted to do something, but I couldn't figure out how to approach it. And so uh, I flipped open a book I had on Bosch, and there was uh, a garden, uh, a Temptation of St. Anthony. So I started taking little fragments of that and blowing it up to a, a larger size, which I gave titles like relating to Chernobyl. Hmm. And then I went on just using uh, uh, Bosch and Bruegel for a while, uh, hmm. ripping them off a little bit. And, uh, and like those artists, Bosch and Bruegel, really looking at sort of the foibles that humankind has done to our planet and so on. Yeah. 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 Um, and, uh, and obviously in the same vein here, um, what is this one, Manet can't paint the ocean like I can. Why he can, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, here uh, I got into salmon fishing in the early 80s and got a Boston, a little Boston whaler. And my friend Katsukata and I started going out uh, salmon fishing, and this was a big salmon I got one day. Brought it back and had canvas ready and uh, just traced it in Conti crayon uh, all around. And uh, it's about the demise of the fishing basically. Mm -hmm. the, and looking through a Manet uh, uh, catalog book, came across this image of the Battle of the Alabama and the Kearsage, which uh, was an uh, actual battle that took place. And so seeing the, the salmon's battle for, you know, to survive and... Um, a, a parallel. Parallel. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, explain real quickly what's that one about? Just having fun with uh, okay. materials. Yeah, yeah. A record that Mike Anderson really and I did called the Sabotage got included. And a pair of beautiful pair of uh, elk antlers that uh, okay. Andy Giddings gave to me, and it has a little bit of a motion. If you turn it loose, wow. it does a does a little uh, swing around. No uh, fault insurance. Amadou. Uh, young black man in New York, uh, uh, standing outside his building late at night. Cop cars go by, see him, approach him, ask him for his ID. He reaches for his ID. One of the cops says he's going for a gun, and they shot him 40 times. Mm. And it says on the, the, the Bosch uh, thing there, 41 hits, uh, no one guilty. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, 
devastating. Blink, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, book called Blink has a very uh, sad and beautiful uh, recreation of what happened that evening if you're interested. And then of course 9-11 impacted you as well. It was happening the morning I walked into the studio. I don't have TV so I never saw any of it but I turned on the radio and it was just uh, coming in and uh, so I did uh, several works uh, involving uh, just mental reaction to that. And Mr. Magoo made it into this thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I read on a page somewhere uh, attributed to a Sufi sage, the statement says, um, you think you must understand one because one and one, you think because you understand one, you must understand two because one and one make two but you must also understand and. Ah, very good. So the ampersand became, I'm still dealing with ampersand. And why Mr. Magoo, by the way? He just appeared. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this uh, work relates to the uh, work in the exhibition, so let's move to this tapestry, yeah. which was, um, who fabricated this for you? Uh, Magnolia Workshop in uh, Oakland, and uh, then they could tell you more specifically where it goes in Belgium. I've never been there, mm -hmm. but uh, Don and Nera Farnsworth, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and the story, really briefly, uh, it's a. Uh, I've been messing around a lot more now with titles involving abstraction. Uh, snake frightened by time and abstraction, color time and abstraction. And a uh, friend, Michel Arisard, a uh, French guy I met, uh, sent me this beautiful book called Harapolo Hieroglyphica. And it's Egyptian hieroglyphics that have been translated back into woodcuts. Mm -hmm. And so I've been purloining a lot of the imagery from, from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where the snake uh, comes from. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what to do one day. <laughs> and I was thinking, ah, this must be like writer's block. And, um, I thought, well, I've got painter's block. And once I thought about that, that gave me the idea. For the idea <laughs> got rid of the block. Yeah. So you had to document it. Okay. Right. And uh, this one here, from a book in, uh, on alchemy. It's an uh, alchemical line tortured by uh, abstractions. Okay, relating to the tapestry thing. Yeah. Oh, and then this pinball machine, which is actually uh, an example of participatory art. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, another uh, group out there called Electric Works uh, had a collector who was a collector of pinball machines, and uh, they proposed Joe Sweeney, he's his name, and they proposed Joe, how about if we take, he sometimes he has several of the same uh, venue, of the same machine, and he says, how about if we strip them down and have an artist redesign the, uh, the pinball machine. He said, yeah, okay. So we did an addition. And what do you actually see there in the game? It's a little hard to, to pick it up here. Well, there's Mr. Unnatural is on the screen up there. <laughs> okay. And uh, he's talking to Billy, uh, who has his skateboard. And, um, and then some of the other images are related that are on the board. And it's a working punball machine. A punball uh, machine. Yeah, with uh, flippers and everything. And it lights and uh, you know, does, does the whole, just like a pinball machine, just my imagery. And now we're getting into some very recent uh, works. Uh, it's re repainting, repainting the bloodshed. Repainting the bloodshed. And what bloodshed are we referring to here? <clears throat> All the bloodshed, the rag, uh, we're, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. All the blood we're shedding from can't stop hacking and hewing on each other mm. since we've been here. Mm. And then uh, I think this is our last one, just us native aliens. <laughs> yeah. Okay, is that just us? Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> just us native aliens. It does remind me <clears throat> a couple, well, couple, was, of, couple of quotes. Uh, yeah. I read Paul Reps uh, mm -hmm. wrote Sin Flesh, Sin Bones. Just before he died, he said his one ambition while he'd been here was to try and land a human being on Earth. Mm. <laughs> well, at the same time, I see it going back to your Columbus 
thing, mm. and and not to mention the border issues that we're facing here in our region of the world. Right. So um, that's one of the power, great powers of art, and of course you do it with a little humor, but you put it out there and um, we can extract something from that and hopefully it helps us get to the next step in our growth. And um, your art, we've looked at a lot of it today and it's been a great journey for you, I'm sure, and we are all the better for it. And so now, uh, let's thank you. And um, see if there's some questions from the audience. And, and Cassandra has a microphone, and since we're taping, we'd like you to speak into the mic. So if you raise your hand and uh, with a question for Bill Wiley, we'd be happy to, uh, to take that. Before we do that, I want to share one other quote for you. And I, unfortunately, I, I just heard it on the radio. I don't know who to attribute it to. But the quote is, we're the only species on the planet that will put up with incompetent leadership. And when I told my friend Michael Hannon, a poet I work with out there, he says, in fact, we demand it. <laughs> well, any questions? Good. Let's go. Okay, well, well, okay, well, but also, I just want to remind you, this beautiful book, Retrospective of William T. Wiley is available in our museum store. Pick one up today and you can get it signed. And thank you again for coming to a conversation with Thanks, you. Thanks, David, for having me here.